All right, what we have here today is a bowling ball. And we're gonna take this bowling ball and throw it down a lane or toss it down a lane. And when you let go of a bowling ball normally, at first it's not rotating, it's just sliding along. But then eventually after coasting some distance down the, the lane, it winds up rolling without slipping. So what we're going to do today is go through and figure out exactly how far this bowling ball is going to skid down the lane before it is rolling without slipping. Now in order for this bowling ball to go from simply translating or moving horizontally to rolling without slipping, there's going to need to be some friction between the ball and the lane. So we're simply going to say there's some coefficient of friction, mu, between the ball and the lane. Now there's actually two ways of solving this problem. One is looking at force and torque and kinematics. The other way is to do this using angular momentum. So today I'm going to solve this problem using angular momentum. Now the issue that always comes up when you dealing with angular momentum is choosing the right point to look around. Because depending on where you choose to measure angular momentum around, you can get different values. And so what we want to do in this problem is find a point around which there are no torques acting on the ball. Now as the ball skids from here to here, we know gravity is going to be acting down on the ball and the normal force is going to be acting up. Additionally, we know friction is going to be acting on the ball right where it contacts the ground backwards. So looking at the free body diagram for this ball, we can see right here at this point where the ball contacts the ground, there are no torques acting on the ball. Yes, there are forces acting on the ball, but none of them are producing any torque right around this point. And so what that means is we can say that angular momentum is conserved around this point right here. Now, if angular momentum is conserved around this point, this means later on, once the ball is rolling without slipping, it will still have the same amount of angular momentum right around this point where it contacts the ground. So in this problem, we're going to say the initial angular momentum equals the final angular momentum at that point where the ball contacts the ground. So first, let's look at the initial angular momentum when the ball is simply translating. When the ball first contacts the ground, it's not rotating yet. It is only translating. And so what we can do is we can look at this ball as though it is simply a particle moving along at some initial velocity vi. So using angular momentum, we can say the angular momentum is going to be the radius. That is the distance between the center of mass of the ball and the point around which we're concerned. That is the point where the edge of the ball contacts the ground. So that's going to be the radius of the ball this dimension from the center of the ball to here, multiplied by its linear momentum, that is mv initial. Now let's take a look at the ball once it's rolling without slipping. So looking at the ball once it's rolling without slipping, we'll notice the ball is going to be moving along and we can't treat it as though it's a particle simply moving along anymore. So we're not going to be able to use this equation uh, which was really rp sine theta anymore. We're going to have to look at this as though we're dealing with some inertia or some distribution of mass. That means we're going to have to treat this as though it has some final moment of inertia and some final angular velocity. Now this is a ball which is rolling without slipping and you can treat this ball as though it is moving along at this instant and just in this instant when it's rolling without slipping, we can treat it as though it is rotating around this point right here. And I know that seems a little bit strange to think that the ball is rotating around this point, but for just an instant, it does. And if we're able to look at the ball as though it's rotating around this point, then we can find the total inertia 
of this ball. And we can do that using the parallel axis theorem. Now you remember, the parallel axis theorem tells us the total inertia of an object is equal to its inertia around its center of mass plus md squared, where d is the distance between the center of mass, in this case the center of the ball, and the edge, or the axis of rotation which we're dealing with, which in this case is the edge. So in this problem, we've got a sphere, which is going to have an inertia around its center of mass of two-fifths, mr squared, plus, treating this as though it's a point mass, rotating around this point right here, we're going to have a mass m as some radius r, r being the distance from the center of the ball to its edge. We'll square that. So this gives us a total inertia, once this ball is rolling without slipping, of 2 fifths plus really 5 fifths mr squared, so that's 7 fifths mr squared. Substituting this in up here, we get 7 fifths mr squared, and then you'll notice we have this angular velocity right here. Now I want you to realize this angular velocity is, is in angular terms. I want to express this in rotational terms. And so for this ball which is rolling without slipping, we can say that the angular velocity, omega, is equal to v over r. So I'll substitute this term in right here. And we get a little bit of cancellation. Now in equating this final angular momentum to our original or initial angular momentum, we get, and I'm going to call this v final because it is in fact the final velocity of the ball. And you'll see, we get a nice little happy cancellation of our radii and the mass of the ball goes away as well. So the fact of the matter is whether you're using a great big bowling ball, a big 25 pounder or whatever, or you're using the little kid's 12 pounder, that, that's okay, the mass doesn't matter. That's not gonna affect what's happening in this problem. What we're gonna find, regardless of how far this ball skids down the lane before it starts rolling without slipping, the final velocity of the ball versus the initial velocity of the ball, independent of its mass, its radius, or the amount of friction, it, is always going to be given by this. And that is to say the final velocity is always going to be 5 sevenths of its initial velocity. Always. So now the question comes up, how do we relate these values, the initial and final velocities, to friction and our, our term mu, which is given to us in the problem, as well as the displacement? And the answer here is by using Newton's second law and kinematics. Looking at this ball, as this moves along, we know the ball is going to be slowing down because friction is acting backwards on the ball. And so we know that using Newton's second law, F equals MA, and in the horizontal axis, the only force acting on the ball is in fact a friction force. So we can say the friction force equals ma horizontally, or to expand that out a little bit farther, we could say mu mg equals ma. And again, the masses cancel out. So again, you can use that 12 pound ball when you go bowling, nobody can pick on you about that, right? So now we have a term for acceleration, we can relate the initial and final velocities, and we're trying to solve for displacement. So now we simply need to use the correct kinematic equation. And substituting in our values here, knowing V final is actually this term, having our initial velocity simply given to us in the problem, having an expression for A, that's mu G, and then D is our displacement. Now we need to be real careful here, this 5 sevenths squared is really all within a parentheses. So when we expand this out, we're going to get 25 forty ninths vi squared is equal to vi squared plus 2 mu g d. And in moving this term over here, what we're going to come up with is this expression right here. 
where the distance is a function of the initial velocity, mu, the coefficient of friction, as well as g. Now, one thing I do want to mention with this, this is a kinetic coefficient of friction because the ball is sliding the entire time. I don't care at all about the static friction here. So what we've done in this problem is we've taken a look at the motion of this bowling ball and figured out how far it's going to travel by applying the conservation of angular momentum around the correct point. In this case, the point about which the ball touches the ground. So what we have here is a result that is probably not too life changing. I doubt you're sitting in your chair watching this video going, oh my gosh, my life will never be the same knowing this value. But uh, what this is, is just a real good application of, of angular momentum and being able to choose the correct point about to look at angular momentum. Uh, this is a problem that showed up on the APC test a few years back. Uh, and so it shows up in lots of different ways. But this is what I call the bowling ball problem. And that's all for now.